a volcano on the equator in the Pacific Ocean. And on its very rim, among the lava boulders, life, a giant tortoise. Inside another, in its very throat, an iguana climbs down the walls to lay its eggs on the floor of the crater. Yet this is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. Closer to the coast, molten lava spouts from yet another vent. Alongside the lava flow lives another iguana. Like creatures from some creation myth, these reptiles manage astonishingly to live among the fires that build the earth. The Galapagos Islands are home to the only seagoing lizard in the world, the marine iguana. In spite of the crashing surf, the iguanas manage to graze on lush growths of marine algae that flourish around the coasts. After an hour or so in the sea, these lizards have to come to land to warm up again in the sun. Getting ashore is not always easy. This is the coast of Fernandina, the most westerly and the newest of the Galapagos Islands, and home to the biggest concentration of marine iguanas. It's January, the beginning of the hot season, the time for them to begin to breed. Big males roam aggressively through the herd of females, establishing their breeding territories, and that means battling with rivals. Shaking the head is a challenge, and one that has to be met. While the larger males were fighting, a subordinate has moved in to mate with a female. The big male regularly surveys his territory and he spotted the trespasser. This cannot be allowed. He drags the female away and carries her off to the center of his domain. Once the female receives his sperm, she will become unreceptive and will not mate again this year. The intruder will have to try again elsewhere. The iguanas congregate in herds around the coastal areas where there's easy access to the sea, 
and the riches it contains. There are 15 main islands in the Galapagos archipelago. In contrast to the sea around them, they are largely barren and dominated by craters and lava fields. All over the last five million years have been built by volcanoes erupting from cracks in the Earth's crust, deep below on the floor of the ocean, a process that still continues today. Rivers of molten rock pour down the volcano's flanks, lighting the equatorial night with their glow. Nothing can stand in their path as they flow inexorably downhill into the sea. When dawn comes, it reveals that the lava has run right through a grove of Palo Santo trees, the home of a pair of Galapagos hawks and a large colony of land iguanas. Some of the survivors are making their escape across the cooling fringes of the lava, but at the cost of scorching their feet. Others were not so lucky. On the coast, the lava created more havoc among the wildlife. Birds lost their regular roosts, but they were able to fly to safety. Many of the marine iguanas, however, were boiled alive in the sea. Only a few escaped, and now a completely new landscape faces them and the flightless corals. It's February. On a nearby beach, the female marine iguanas are digging holes. Four weeks ago, they had mated, and now it's time to lay their eggs. have appeared in the mangroves beside the beach. The arrival of the hawks has not gone unnoticed. Out on the beach, the females are exposed and exhausted from digging. It's time for them to leave. As the hawks take off, the female iguanas run for a place where they'll be safe, the sea. too heavy a victim. The outcome is by no means a foregone conclusion. The female will still have a chance if only she can get to the water. And finally, the hawk gives up, but the iguana is dead. Males, being bigger, are usually safe from attack and have been basking in the sun before going into the water. long claws that enable them to cling to the rocks and resist the pull of the swell, 
as they rip off the algae. Although these are air-breathing animals, they regularly remain underwater for 10 minutes at a time. But they seldom stay out at sea for longer than an hour because they get chilled and lose their energy. Little wrasse swim alongside them, gathering the small creatures disturbed as the algae is pulled up. fish have appeared. They are pursued by sea lions, descendants from immigrants that came down from California in the distant past. Sea lions, like iguanas, are air breathers, but being mammals, they generate their own body heat, and so they're able to spend long hours in the water. and warmer waters flow down from the north, raising the temperature of the sea. Evaporation from the ocean surface increases and clouds build up above the islands. Soon, there will be rain. All the inhabitants of the Galapagos seem to appreciate the refreshment that it brings. For the land iguanas, inland from the coast, it brings the rare chance of a drink. Isabella, the largest of the islands, has had rain for several weeks, and pools have formed on the floor of its central volcano, Alcedo. The giant tortoises take in gallons and store it in their bladders as a reserve for the droughts ahead. The hawks are beginning their courtship flights. The tortoises too, after feasting on the newly sprung grass, will soon begin their mating. The males are all somewhat bigger than their mates, but this one has picked a particularly diminutive partner. A young hawk seems baffled by these heaving boulders. It's a tricky and apparently exhausting business, and the groans of the males carry for miles, echoing around the crater.
Alcedo is only one of six large volcanoes on the island of Isabella. Each has its own population of tortoises that, being separated by barren fields of lava, have, in isolation, evolved their own individual characters. Fernandina, west of Isabella, once had tortoises too, but none survive there today. It is, however, a stronghold of the marine iguanas, and the eggs they laid on the beach, warmed by the sun, are now hatching. For the great blue heron, this is a good time. For the hatchlings, there is a hundred meters of open sand to cross before they reach the safety of the water. Herons are not the only enemy they have to face. Galapagos snakes don't kill their victims with venom, they squeeze them to death. But first, they have to catch them. In order to reach the sea, some young iguanas must first cross an old lava flow. The snakes know this, and several of them are there, waiting in ambush. The snake can unhinge its lower jaw and engulf prey that is stouter than itself. Death comes to the young iguana from suffocation. Some iguanas find safety in deep cracks that have formed in the lava. That crack was just not narrow enough. The ancestral iguanas are thought to have arrived in the Galapagos as involuntary passengers from South America on floating vegetation several million years ago. And while one branch of their descendants stayed beside the sea, another took to the hills. In 
patches of vegetation on the lower slopes of Fernandina, the land iguanas are now gathering to breed. Each male has dug a number of burrows, and the females come to inspect them. Her nod, however, is an aggressive no rather than a submissive yes. But he persists. Now she seems almost indifferent to him. She allows a mockingbird to clean her by picking off dead bits of her skin, which it then eats. She makes a meal from one of the plants growing on the male's land. He's beginning to lose patience. This is not the place to mate. It's better to take her to the center of his territory where he is least likely to be interrupted. His contribution to the partnership is almost finished. When they separate, he'll stay here and wait for another female to turn up. But her labors are only just beginning. For now, she sets off on a quite extraordinary journey. She starts to ascend the flanks of Fernandina, going up towards the crater. She'll have to climb up to 1,500 meters above sea level, and the journey to the top will take her 10 days or more. Close to the rim of the crater, steam spouts from fumaroles, and this keeps the ash warm and moist, the perfect place for a reptile to leave her eggs. She follows a well-worn path up to the nesting ground. Hundreds have already been this way in the last week or so. Suitable ground is limited and much of it already occupied. She spots an area that seems vacant. But it's not. There seems to be no room for her here. The sun is beginning to set. At this altitude, the nights can be very cold, and that's bad for a reptile. She has to find shelter. A small cave, just the place. Others are already inside, but nonetheless, she's allowed in. the temperature begins to fall dangerously. But steam percolating from below keeps the dormitory snugly warm.
In the cool morning air, steam swirls upwards, heated by the magma chambers below. But the nesting ground is fully occupied. She and other latecomers have to move on. There's only one place to go now, over the lip of the crater and down into it. Fernandina Crater is immense. Eruptions emptied the lava chamber deep below and the top of the mountain collapsed, forming this huge caldera. No one knows when it will explode again. The walls of the crater have not yet stabilized after the last eruption and are continually collapsing. She and her companions start on what seems to be a suicidal journey. They descend into the crater. The crater floor is almost a kilometre below. The walls are steep and dangerously unstable. The slightest disturbance can send tons of rocks hurtling downwards, and each year the iguanas have to find new paths down. migrants are killed each year, but still they come. they reach the crater floor. Ash lies thickly here. In some areas, steam from below keeps it warm. And there, just below the surface, it's a constant 30 degrees centigrade, the perfect temperature to incubate iguana eggs. There is more room down here. But any attempt to dig in a place that might disturb the eggs that have already been buried there will lead to violence. She must be cautious. place of her own at last. Even after all this, there is no certainty of success. Some years an eruption will destroy all the eggs. Nor are the females' labours yet over. They still have to climb out of the crater and trek ten kilometres down the volcano back to their home grounds. July brings relief from the hot season. Trade winds from the southeast drive cool air up the sides of the volcano, and the moisture they carry condenses into low-lying fog. 
This is the Garua. For the next six months, these mists will be the only source of moisture on the islands. 25 kilometers to the east of Fernandina lies the Alcedo volcano. There, the arrival of the Garua is a signal for the tortoises in the crater to climb up to the rim and collect the liquid the mists bring. There are several kinds of birds up here. A finch collects ticks from the tortoises, just as mockingbirds pick skin from the iguanas. And the tortoises invite them to do so by adopting a special posture so that the birds can reach every possible part of their skin. Tortoises, after all, can't scratch themselves. Neither can they clean their nostrils so this arrangement suits both parties. In the western part of the archipelago, the Garua sweeps around the slopes of Fernandina and over the lava fields, blocking out the sun for several hours each morning. As the mists burn off, the marine iguanas begin their daily trip down the beach to the sea. At this time of the year, cool currents sweep in from the coast of South America, a thousand kilometers away to the east. And cold, rich waters from the central Pacific often well up from the depths, producing lush growths of marine algae. The algae grow with phenomenal speed, and they need to, for along this stretch of coast live tens of thousands of marine iguanas. The hatchlings are now three months old, and they feed on the algae exposed on the rocks at low tide. Sea lion pups of around the same age don't go out to sea either. They stay in the shallows, playing boisterously with one another. And not only with one another. For them, an iguana seems to be yet another toy. By the early afternoon, most of the iguanas have finished grazing and are sunbathing to get the heat they need to be able to digest their meals. Some of the hatchlings stay together on their own patch of the beach, but others mingle with the adults. And that is the safer place to be. The hawk won't tackle a full-grown male iguana. It's too big and powerful. A young hatchling, however, is a different matter.
young reptile dies and a young bird is kept alive. For this is also the time that the Galapagos hawk breeds. There are two chicks in the nest. The bigger one is always fed first. Only when it is satisfied will the smaller one get any food. But this year has been a good one for the iguanas. So there's plenty of food for both chicks. Back on the coast, the sea lions too are giving birth. The mother tears away the birth membranes so that her baby can get its first breath of air. As it breathes, so it calls. And that is vitally important, for the two must learn to recognize the sound of one another's voices and so be able to find one another in days to come. The sea lion's afterbirth is high-grade protein, and both crabs and iguanas are quick to claim it. The rich upwelling nutrients along the coast stimulate the boobies to begin their courtship. A blue-footed booby needs to show its As the iguanas settle down to sleep, they continually spurt liquid from their noses. This is a salty fluid that drains into their nostrils from special glands that excrete the salt they take in with their meals of seaweed. The sun begins to sink. The day cools and the iguanas cluster together to keep warm. During the night, the Garua rolls in across the summit of Fernandina. At dawn, mist clings to the coast because of the continued presence of cold waters. It's a signal for the penguins to gather and court. Like the Bluefoots, penguins only breed when food is plentiful. And it has arrived. The rich waters along the coast have attracted huge swarms of bait fish. Penguins love bait fish. is to drive a shoal into shallow water where there's less room for the fish to maneuver. Forced near the surface, others can dive in from above. Pelicans. beaks and swallow their catch without being pestered by penguins. But now there are others to trouble them. Noddy terns. Bluefoots can fish much farther out to sea. They often detect the presence of a shoal near the surface by the activities of dolphins, who are searching for the same thing.
the sea lions also follow dolphins. And when, at last, the prize is discovered, there's a frenzy of feeding. Carried from below by dolphins and sea lions, the shoal rises towards the surface and gives the Bluefoots their chance. Back on the cliffs, the young Bluefoots are exercising the wings they've not yet used and playing with the marine iguanas. Such activities all help to develop the young boobies' skills of manipulation and build up their wing muscles in preparation for the time when they too will need to catch fish. The hawk chicks, well nourished on their diet of young iguanas, are now two months old and almost ready to fly, eager, doubtless, to go and find food for themselves. Last year's broods of hawks gather from all around the island and demonstrate their competence in the air above the summit of Fernandina. They're keeping a sharp eye on the floor of the crater below, for their biggest feast of the year is about to begin. It's now October, a hundred days since the female land iguanas were here laying their eggs. Those should now be on the verge of hatching. what is about to happen, and all are determined to claim their share. The first of the hatchlings emerges. Though totally inexperienced, they obviously sense the danger posed by the hawks. The eggs in each clutch hatch almost simultaneously, and the youngsters will stand a better chance if they all run for cover together. One decides to make a break for it. The others see that the attention of the hawks has been diverted. The 
It's hot work waiting around. The ash is now 50 degrees centigrade. There are just too many talons around to escape them all. Once they reach the crater wall, there is more cover, but the hawks can still outwit them. They're only six inches long, they've not yet fed, and are dependent for their energy entirely on the little yolk that remains in their belly. And they still have to climb a crater wall a thousand meters high. of the crater at last. But this is only a brief triumph. Neither the journey nor its dangers are over yet. A short distance below is the steaming fumarole and nesting area which their mothers passed three months earlier on their way into the caldera. Up to a dozen snakes have gathered here. Some slither into the burrows where the females had laid their eggs, listening for the vibrations made by hatching iguanas as they dig their way up to the surface. Things can outrun the snakes if they get a reasonable start. But the snakes are everywhere. few that make their escape climb up a plant or a boulder every now and then to get a better view of the way ahead. There is a long way to go yet. Their final destination is the vegetated slopes of the volcano 1300 meters below. Down on the coast their cousins the young marine iguanas are now six months old and increasingly confident as they graze among the waves. It will be several years yet before they're big enough and strong enough to join their parents cropping on the sea floor. The reptiles of the Galapagos live in an isolated world. But it's no island paradise. They're surrounded at all times by danger from the land, the sea, and the sky. The very rocks they live on regularly split apart and erupt far. 
but it's these very perils and privations that have changed and refined these species to such a degree that today there are no other creatures anywhere else in the world like the dragons of the Galapagos.